Okay, so when the ACLU was founded 100 years ago, the technology landscape was very different from today. <laughs> I don't think anyone could have imagined that 100 years later, we would all be sitting on computers in, in different areas, some people indoors, some people outdoors, um, meeting via Zoom. Uh, television hadn't even been invented um, when the ACLU was founded. So no one could have imagined at that time um, civil liberties extending to issues of technology and where we are today with technology. Um, every new technology that comes out has created challenges for civil rights and liberties. The internet, while it has revolutionized work, entertainment, um, us connecting with each other like this morning. It's also enabled new ways for the government to track our everyday lives um, for not only the government, but also other entities to track our information, um, collect our data, where we're shopping, what internet pages we're looking at. Um, and there are a lot of questions about who has a right to control our data, who has a right to access data where we've been, where we are, what we're doing on the internet, and what can be done with that data. Um, so Chad Barlow, our speaker today, he is the Senior Advocacy and Policy Counsel for the ACLU. That means he's a top dog attorney, is <laughs> what that's fancy speak for. Um, his job, he focuses on the intersection of technology and civil rights especially regarding privacy issues and surveillance issues. He's very well known for his work on net neutrality, police body cameras, and student surveillance. He has authored 18 ACLU bills and dozens of articles. He directs the ACLU nationwide campaign, Take Control and Community Control Over Police Surveillance. Um, both of those campaigns, and his work has received national and international media coverage. He holds a Juris Doctorate in Law from the University of Virginia and a Bachelor's in Government from Connecticut College. And please join me in welcoming Chad Marlowe to today's meeting. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Gretchen, uh, and good, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm I'm extremely grateful uh, to have been asked to speak to the ACLU of Florida's Greater Tampa chapter this morning, uh, and, to, and to all of you for participating in this event uh, today. It, it is uh, not lost on me that uh, we are uh, at the end of a very, very challenging year. And so giving up some free time on a, on a Saturday to participate in an event like this um, speaks a great deal about each and every one of you. And I am very appreciative and, and very grateful to all of you uh, today. Um, beyond my passion for talking about the intersection of surveillance, policing, and racial justice, uh, there are three reasons why I wanted to be here this morning in particular. The, the first is that the ECLU of Florida's Tampa chapter is, is widely recognized as being one of the ECLU's strongest and most effect, effective chapters in the nation. And, and I personally could not pass up an opportunity to thank all of you for the work that you have done and continue to do uh, to protect and advance civil rights and civil liberties uh, in your state. Uh, the second is that my mother is a resident of Florida. So the work that you do directly benefits my mom and what son would not be particularly grateful for that. Uh, third, third and finally, uh, as a New Yorker uh, and specifically as a New York Jets fan, I wanted to directly and personally thank Tampa for taking Tom Brady away from New England Patriots. Uh, I'm... <laughs> I'm sure your Super Bowl win was thanks enough, uh, but had Tom been lifting that Lombardi trophy with the red, white, and blue uniform on again, I might have lost it. So my sanity thanks you for that. Um, so now that we've dispensed with that initial housekeeping, um, I wanted to take the time we have together today to speak to you about mm -hmm. surveillance, uh, the ever-expanding use of surveillance technologies by local law enforcement, and the particular threat such technologies pose to communities of color and the efforts to reform policing in America. 
Uh, at the outset, I wanted to ensure all of you that I am not a tinfoil hat guy. Uh, every threat that I'm gonna describe and every technology that I'm gonna talk about today is very well documented. They are regretfully all very real. Uh, if you're a fan of Alice in Wonderland, welcome to the rabbit hole. If you prefer the matrix, get ready to swallow the red pill. When I talk about the use of surveillance technologies in this country and their use in Florida, I always start with this important observation. While surveillance technologies threaten the privacy and liberty of everyone, they do not threaten the privacy and liberty of everyone equally. In truth, both surveillance technologies and surveillance in general has always been disproportionately focused on persons and communities of color. To be sure, surveillance has also targeted other groups, including Muslims, Southeast Asians, the LGBT community, political activists, and even students, which is a particularly disturbing problem in Florida as of late. But no community has borne the brunt of surveillance in the United States more than our black and brown communities. This should come as no surprise, given that surveillance is largely conducted by the police and that policing is overwhelmingly focused on communities of color. What may be a surprise, however, is how deep-seated the practice of surveilling persons and communities of color is in America. When a lot of people think about surveillance and persons of color, their minds may stretch back as far as the 1950s and 1960s, when for many years, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover used his domestic counterintelligence program called COINTELPRO to spy on Martin Luther King Jr. As you may know, after finding evidence of marital infidelity, the FBI infamously sent MLK a letter informing him of the FBI's findings and not so subtly suggesting that the private facts discovered by the FBI would stay private if MLK took his own life. As it turns out, however, America's practice of surveilling persons of color is older than the civil rights movement, much older. In fact, this American practice is older than America itself. I say this because the first example of a codified surveillance law that targeted persons of color dates back to New York City in pre-revolutionary war times. The law of which I'm specifically speaking was adopted in March 1713 by the Common Council of the City of New York and was titled a law for regulating Negro and Indian slaves in the night. For short, it was referred to as the Lantern Law. The Lantern Law stated that any Black or Indigenous person who was walking around New York City at night and not in the company of a white person had to carry a lighted lantern held up near their face. The purpose of this law was twofold. First, by illuminating a person's face at night, it was far easier to identify their race. Second, by forcing Black and Indigenous persons to carry a lit lantern around in such a manner, it was far easier to identify and track them as they moved about. And who was empowered to arrest anyone found in violation of this surveillance law? Any white person. This American tradition of targeting persons and communities of color with surveillance extends fully into the present day when surveillance is as is as likely, if not even potentially more likely, to be effectuated by a machine than by a person. Police departments, as a general rule, are not very forthcoming about their ownership and use of modern surveillance technologies. That being said, when the ACLU and our allies have been able to pull back the curtain of secrecy around the use of surveillance technology, we have always found their deployment to be disproportionately focused on communities of color. Specifically, through the use of FOIA requests, we have from time to time been successful in gathering data about the specific deployments of surveillance technologies, such as the use of fake cell phone towers and license plate readers, two of the many surveillance technologies I will discuss in further detail in a moment. When we have placed that data on a map, 
and then overlaid that surveillance map on another map showing the racial composition of the various neighborhoods throughout a city, the two maps track almost exactly. These surveillance maps reveal a massive deployment of surveillance technologies in black and brown neighborhoods and their virtual absence from white neighborhoods. Their use literally comes to a screeching halt at the dividing lines, be they a road or the proverbial railroad tracks. We have seen this in cities all over the country, including Oakland, California, Lansing, Michigan, Boston, Massachusetts, Baltimore, Maryland, and Tallahassee, Florida. While the racist nature of surveillance in these cities may not provide unassailable proof that such racist deployments are happening in your city, it does raise the fair question, what is it about your city and your police that would make you think it's the exception to this overwhelming rule? And let's be even more direct and to the point given the event we're at this morning. What reason do we have to think that, for example, the Tampa Police Department is bucking the national trend of over-policing and over-surveilling communities of color? Using lawyer speak, if you'll forgive me, I think it's fair to say that based on this nationwide evidence, there is at least a rebuttable presumption that such over-policing and over-surveilling is happening in Tampa and in virtually every other city in town in the state of Florida. Let's take a pause to talk about some of the surveillance technologies that are in active use today. As I go through some of these technologies, I will point out where, where, where we know they are being used by the Tampa Police Department, but bear in mind, there's much we do not know. So the first technology I wanna talk about, and again, as a reminder, all of these are real and they are being used today. The first technology I wanted to talk about today are most frequently referred to as either cell site simulators or by, their, by a popular brand name of one of the devices, which is called a Stingray. And what a cell site simulator is, is essentially a fake cell phone tower. And the way that it operates is somewhat like the children's game of Marco Polo. When the fake cell phone tower shouts out Marco, all of your phones that are within its range have no option but to shout back Polo. And in shouting back Polo, they tell that Stingray device that you are there and specifically where you are located. So in other words, it has the ability of turning your cell phone into a tracking device without your knowledge. Stingrays are not not a precise technology. So I cannot use a stingray to identify the phone of one criminal suspect. When I use a stingray, it will suck up the information of hundreds and possibly thousands of people within its range. Because it is a fake cell phone tower, if your phone is connecting to it, it may also interfere with your ability to use your phone. Now, given that we know that these technologies are disproportionately deployed in communities of color, what that means as one practical kind of, if you will, unintended consequence of the use of stingrays is that where they are in use, they can interrupt access to 911 service. Because you dial 911, your phone connects up to a cell phone tower trying to get it to the 911, but if that's a fake cell phone tower, the call dies there. So in addition to spying on whoever it spies on, it can actually interfere with communications where it is used. Now, in terms of your community, uh, there is, we are not certain whether the Tampa Police Department uh, owns uh, Stingray devices, but there is suggestive evidence that they used one in 2017. And there is also uh, fairly strong evidence that they are being used by your county sheriff's office. The next technology I wanted to highlight are automatic license plate readers or ALPRs. The way that ALPRs work is they uh, are, can either be mounted stationary on a location or put on the back of a police car, for example. And they will go around scanning the license plates of every license plate they see. So in effect, 
when they see this real world image, they identify it, digitize it. So it means something to a computer. That license plate is Florida ABC 123. It can then run it against databases to see if, if, if that license plate is, is of any particular interest. And it can also just store the fact that it was seen. So if it spots a particular car, it can say, I saw that car at first in Maine at this time on this date, and then save that information away. The problem with that is that if you have enough of these license plate readers deployed in a particular community or city, it is possible to put together a map of where anyone has driven in public for as long as they choose to hold on to the data. And while some people who use ALPRs will keep their data for a matter of days, it is far more common in the absence of regulation for police departments to keep that data for years. And what that means is they can then have a record of the religious institutions a person goes to, of what political meetings they go to, what doctor's offices they go to, even where they sleep at night, whether it's their own home or another home. This is the sort of private information that reveals a huge amount about any individual person. Now, that's not to say that there aren't potential good uses for ALPRs. For example, some, some jurisdictions use them for toll collection, where instead of having to stop at a toll booth and idle and pollute the environment and cause congestion, people just drive through. And if the ALPR data is only kept for a couple of days in, term, in order to issue the bill for the toll, not a particular problem. But again, if they decide that they want to use those all over the place, not just to tolls and keep the data for a matter of years, it can really kind of eviscerate privacy in terms of where you choose to travel uh, in an automobile. The next technology, which has been in the news a lot lately, is facial recognition. Oh, I should first mention, by the way, uh, we are not certain about whether uh, the Tampa Police Department owns ALPRs, but the county sheriff and many local police departments in the greater Tampa area absolutely do. And we have uh, evidence of that. Uh, the next technology is facial recognition. What facial recognition does is it turns your face in, into something akin to a fingerprint. It will measure the distance and geometry of various parts of your face. You know, how far from your nose to your forehead, from one of your pupils to the next, how wide is your mouth, from your ears to your chin. And in gathering all these measurements, they can actually collect a face print of you that is as unique as your fingerprint. The problem with facial recognition is twofold, and each of them is extraordinarily problematic. The first is the impact that it has on concepts of privacy when you move about in public. If facial recognition technology is applied to a system of surveillance cameras maintained by the government, it creates the ability to identify and track you wherever you move in public. In being able to do that, not just with you, but with everyone else, they can also figure out who you meet with in public, who you choose to associate with in public. The practical result of this, the way that I can kind of crystallize it the most, would be imagine if Florida passed a law saying that every person in Florida, when they traveled in public, had to get a blown up picture of their driver's license and wear it on the shirt they were wearing. And in addition, to carry with them at all times in public a government-issued GPS tracking device. That is the potential of facial recognition technology on your public life when you move about in public. In and of itself, that is a reason to be extremely concerned about facial recognition technology. But there's a second problem. And the second problem is this. Facial recognition technology is bad at identifying faces of color, women's faces, very young faces, very old faces, and transgender and non-binary faces. 
In other words, it can identify me and pretty much nobody else. The problem with that is misidentification. And we have many, many examples, uh, and I'll share one with you a little bit later in this talk, where a person of color is misidentified as a criminal suspect, leading to a completely unwarranted and dangerous interaction with the police. In light of everything that is going on in our world, in our country, and in the state of Florida in 2021, that should give us all significant pause. And so in other words, facial recognition is a faulty technology. It is a huge problem if it works well, and it is a huge problem when it doesn't work well. Uh, does the Tampa Police Department use facial recognition? It sure does. As a matter of fact, the database that it has of pictures that it can run against covers more than 25 million pictures from the Florida DMV and mugshot photos. The next technology, which I kind of, it's really two technologies, but I combine into one because they both exist far, far above us, are drones and spy planes. Now, I think most people are familiar with drones. They're basically unmanned aerial vehicles that you can send up into the air. You can attach cameras to them so that they can be used to watch over people uh, in places that they would not easily be able to view in public. And God forbid, they can be weaponized. Uh, there have been places where tear gas uh, dispensers are put on drones where rubber bullets are put on drones. The other technology is spy planes. So spy planes are a, they're actually a small plane. They are, they are, they are manned aircraft, they're, they're not drones. But what they do is they will go up and fly over a city like Tampa. And they have a camera on them that is so powerful, so high definition, and operates at such a wide angle that they can film the comings and goings of every single person in a major city all at once, all the time. Has, has a technology like this been used in the United States? Yes, it has. Uh, it was tried out in Baltimore early in the year. There was a huge effort to promote its use in St. Louis. There's a huge effort right now to promote its use in Detroit. And what it does essentially, again, by flying over and constantly recording at any moment, if, it wanted, if the city or the government or the police wanted to know where you were traveling, you know, they would not be able to identify your face, for example, from that distance, but they could see you walk out of your house and get in your car then they can track your car. They can watch you get out of your car and go to your office and leave your office and get back in your car. And so if they decide to do this recording and keep it for days or for weeks or for months, it literally creates an ability to track every single person in the city all at once. Now, thank God the Tampa Police Department to our knowledge does not have spy planes, but they, they do have drones. The next technology, and, and this is one that, that kind of spooks people and it should, uh, is what are called surveillance light bulbs. So what surveillance light bulbs are, at first glance, and this is a kind of marketing genius, is they're an LED light bulb, an energy efficient, durable LED light bulb. And so you will have companies go to a city and say, you know what, wouldn't it be a great idea to replace those inefficient, uh, and I, when I say inefficient, I mean in terms of energy consumption, inefficient and kind of fragile incandescent light bulbs with LED light bulbs, and cities say yes. And frankly, I agree with that. But then what they say is, for a little more money, if you want to upgrade, we can put a camera and a microphone in every one of the light bulbs you buy. So when you screw them into every street light in your city, you have turned every street light into a surveillance device. 
the microphones in these surveillance light bulbs can be connected to software that can identify troublesome speech. Now, what is troublesome speech? Well, that's all in the eye, the eye, or should I say the ear of the beholder. We know places where mosque uh, generated a red flag. Black Lives Matter generated a red flag. And so what happens with these light bulbs is you will get a lot of cities that say, oh, we are rolling them out as part of what they call a smart cities initiative. I, of course, refer to it as a surveillance city initiative. And they say, oh, but with these light bulbs, we can better monitor traffic. We can monitor when garbage cans need to be emptied. And, and, and I don't doubt that for a minute. But it's, it's kind of like using a bazooka to kill a house fly. There's other ways to monitor traffic and to see that garbage cans need to be emptied without turning your entire city into an Orwellian nightmare where every single streetlight is watching and listening to you. Uh, we do not know whether or not surveillance light bulbs are being used in Tampa, but they are absolutely being used in other, in other cities and in other places like airports and malls throughout the United States. The next technology I want to talk to you about is, is one that not a lot of people actually think about when they think about government surveillance devices. And those are privately owned ring doorbells. Now, for those of you not familiar with ring doorbells, they're essentially a doorbell that has a camera attached to it that you can access using your phone. Ring likes to advertise them as the front line of stopping the scourge of package thefts uh, that, that occur outside your house. The problem is, is they are built out in other ways. There is something that, that, that Ring, and by the way, Ring is owned by Amazon. Uh, Ring promotes using what they call a neighbor's app. And the neighbor's app allows you, if your Ring doorbell captures something that troubles you, to post it online and share it with anyone else who has that app including, and you can give it labels, including suspicious. So I prefer to call the neighbor's app that there's a black person in my white neighborhood app because that is what it actually is overwhelmingly used for. When someone, when something is designated suspicious on the neighbor's app, it is almost always a, a person of color being identified as suspicious. Now that's terrible. But where is that government surveillance? Where it's government surveillance is, Ring has entered into partnerships with local police in which they actually turn your police department into salespersons for Ring. They go around, they tell people that they can get Ring on a discount or even for free, and they encourage the people to get it. More than that, they then encourage the people to register with the police, so they know if you have a ring and can contact you. They encourage you to use the neighbor's app, which the police can monitor. And even if you don't agree, Ring will tell your local police force that you have a ring doorbell so that they can go around and ask you if they can have access to your footage if they want to, so they can use it to, to fight crime. And I can tell you a lot of people understandably feel uncomfortable when the police ask them for a favor. It's not always comfortable to say no to police officers. So the big question, are they doing this in Tampa? Yep, absolutely. The, the Tampa Police Department has, has an agreement and a partnership with Ring. The next technology is something called ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter, by and large, is not an overwhelmingly problematic technology, but it, it's useful to talk about because it can highlight dangers that can be that can lurk within even what appears to be non-problematic technologies. So what ShotSpotter is, ShotSpotter basically are microphones that are deployed throughout a city or in certain communities that when there is a gunshot, will hear it and we'll use the microphones to triangulate where the gunshot came from so that police can race to the spot that there was a, a gunshot. Now, in and of itself, that's not particularly problematic, except for two, two aspects of it. One, 
where are the microphones being deployed? If the microphones are being deployed only in communities of color, I know quite a few communities of color that are not super enthusiastic about a technology that will drive even more policing into their community. Although I certainly understand the argument that if there is a gunshot, people would want policing coming into their community. So that's a decision to be made, I would argue, by the people in that community. But the second aspect of it is because shot spotter is based on microphones, there is the possibility of listening to and flipping on those microphones to listen to things other than gunshots. Now, this is not typically how the microphones are used, but in the absence of a clear and enforceable policy that says that the microphones cannot be used for anything other than detecting gunshots, of course they could be. And, and one can imagine that, you know, you know, I live in New York City. If, if we have shot spotter and another 9-11 occurs, I can guarantee you every single one of those microphones are gonna be flipped on. Now, does the Tampa Police Department have shot spotter? It does. The next one uh, are, are, are referred to as either real-time crime centers or fusion centers. Now, what, what that is, is that's not actually a technology as much as it is a gathering point for surveillance data. And what these centers do is they say to local, county, state, and even federal level law enforcement, send all of your surveillance data here. The problem with these centers is that when data is just sent to them as a matter of course, little attention is paid into who else has access to the data. So if you live in a city that doesn't want to share surveillance data with the federal government, but you send it to a crime center or a fusion center, that may happen anyway. If you have a police department that really follows the letter of the law, one of these, let's imagine this, you know, Wizard of Oz as perfect, unassailable police force, not certain that exists, but even hypothetically, if it did, if they then share their data with other police forces who aren't as good, it creates risks beyond those in the control of the, of the police department itself. So no matter how careful a police department may be with its surveillance data, if it shares it with others who are not careful or who have bad motives, they kind of lose the ability to control their data. Does Tampa have a real-time crime center? It does. Uh, the final two I just want to raise for, for people's attention. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but one is social media monitoring software. What social media monitoring software does is it enables the police to basically monitor all public social media accounts. So things like Twitter or, you know, depending on your settings on things like an Instagram or a Facebook, Anything that you send to the public, they're able to monitor. Now, one can make an argument that if people are sending stuff out into the public, uh, is it a problem that the police are, are monitoring? Um, and the answer to that is maybe. It, it depends on why they're monitoring and, and how they're monitoring. So for example, if the police decide that they are only going to monitor social media accounts that they can identify as coming from a community of color or, or that the person running the account has black or brown skin, that's problematic. If they set up their social media monitoring software to, as we have seen in other places, alert them if someone mentions the hashtag Black Lives Matter, that's a problem. And so social media monitoring software, again, is another example um, like ShotSpotter where you can conceive of it being used in a way that doesn't feel problematic in kind of a surface analysis, but when you drill more into it, the problems just hit you like a tidal wave. And the final technology I just wanted to highlight is called predictive policing software. Um, for those of you who've seen the movie Minority Report, this is, this is close to what they imagined in that movie. What predictive policing software claims to do is by looking at crime data, 
it actually tells the police where future crime is most likely to occur so that they can deploy policing resources to those areas. Sounds a little creepy, but, but it's worse than that. The problem with predictive policing software is that it doesn't predict crime, it predicts policing. And the reason I say that is the data that it's based on is data that shows where crime has occurred in the past. But what we know is because policing itself is overwhelmingly focused on communities of color, that's where the data says the crime is. And that makes sense, right? Reverse it the other way. If we put 90% of our policing in white communities, where do you think the data would show the crime was? In the white communities. And so what happens is predictive policing software perpetuates racial biases in policing by using this data to basically predict as if it were demonstrating where future crimes would occur, really just where biased policing has, has occurred in the past. Um, we do not know if, if they have predictive policing software in Tampa yet. So, so now that we've reviewed some of the surveillance technologies that are being used on us, let's return to looking at what's going on today. Over the past decade, due to a massive pool of federal grants that enable local police departments to purchase surveillance technologies and some very savvy marketing by the sellers of surveillance technologies, local police acquisition of surveillance technologies like we've seen in the Tampa area is exploding nationwide. This means that the surveillance of communities of color is also exploding nationwide. In one of the cities that can reasonably claim to be ground zero for the use of police surveillance technologies, which is Camden, New Jersey, things have gotten so bad that an expression has developed. In Camden, New Jersey, is it, it is illegal to stand still if you are black and to walk around if you are white. And what they mean by that is people are being watched so constantly in public that if you are black and standing still, the police are gonna see you and assume you're trying to sell drugs. And that if you're white and walking around, the police are going to see you and assume you were trying to buy drugs. Now, the result of this 24 seven over surveillance is that our communities of color are being transformed into open air prisons where freedom is being diminished and every public behavior is being watched and scrutinized. This means that minor legal infractions that would go completely unnoticed in whiter and wealthier communities are far more likely to lead to police encounters in communities of color and poorer communities. And that statement should give a significant pause. As I said before, if there is one thing we know in 2021, it is how dangerous police encounters can be in communities of color. Not only can such encounters lead to increased arrests and incarcerations, they can lead to death. And being innocent and being committed to doing everything right is no reprieve for persons of color. The ACLU has a client who lives just outside of Detroit, Michigan, whose name is Robert Williams. Robert Williams is a man who, who lives by the letter of the law. He's got a, 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 a wonderful wife and two young girls um, and, and lives a, a, a pretty unremarkable and pretty fantastic life. One day there was a theft, a watch theft in a store in Detroit that had a surveillance camera. The Detroit Police Department, they got that footage and they ran it against a facial recognition database. And it came back with a with hit based on a driver's license photo of Robert Williams. The police then went out to his house and in front of his two young girls, arrested him, threw him in their police car, took him off to jail where he was for 24 hours. That encounter traumatized his daughters. It traumatized his wife and it traumatized Robert. But the truth of the matter is, is, is Robert Williams was lucky because that's all that happened to him. 
And we all know it could have been a lot worse. And so this is the weight that we feel when we talk about surveillance technologies and the way that they are overdeployed against communities of color. So let's ask the question that I imagine is increasingly on everyone's mind. What can we do to stop this? The first step to answering that question is to define what may be at the center of the problem. Namely, that in virtually every city, county, and town in this country, police departments are empowered to make decisions about acquiring and deploying surveillance technologies unilaterally and in secret. That means that it can take years to even learn your police department is using a particular surveillance technology. When you do learn, it is very hard to oppose it because one, the technology has already been acquired, and two, the police have sole authority over if and how they can use it. Even city council's existing power of the purse does not present an adequate check on the acquisition of surveillance technologies by the police. And the reason for that is because surveillance technologies are rarely funded through specific budget line items, as doing so from the police perspective would compromise their secrecy. Rather, the police will opt to purchase surveillance techs using general agency funds, through grants, through privately raised money, through civil asset forfeiture funds, and through in-kind donations. Police department's ability to acquire and use surveillance technologies without approval or oversight leads to another concern that frankly keeps me up at night. The concern is specifically this. In response to the murder of George Floyd and far too many other black men and other persons of color, efforts have been gaining steam to divest from overfunded police departments. One of the ways we can restrict the harms caused by racially based police departments, the persuasive argument goes, is to reduce the scope of their work and the funding that they receive to do it. But as any good advocate knows, the art of advocacy is like the game of chess. True grandmasters think many moves in advance. So if we divest from police departments, what is their next move? I believe their next move will be to ask, how can our police department continue to operate in exactly the same way we always have, but with less money? And I believe the answer that many departments will arrive at is to shift from more expensive, human-driven racist policing to less expensive, surveillance technology-driven racist policing. Less money, same result. Sadly, the truth of the matter is that the power and efficiencies produced by a shift to surveillance technology-driven policing will likely increase police's ability to surveil and over-police communities of color. What do we call that kind of result? Is it policing 2.0? Is it stop and frisk 2.0? But this time, the public will not even know they've been searched. Is it mass incarceration 2.0? As people released from jail are watched until the surveillance provides a gotcha moment that can be used to return them to jail. What we certainly won't call it is progress. And this is not just a scary theory. Remember Camden, New Jersey, where you can't stand still while black or walk while white? Well, you know what led to the overwhelming amount of surveillance that currently blankets that city? In 2013, they abolished their city police department, only to replace it with a surveillance supercharged county-led police department a short time later. So it's time for the million-dollar question. How do we fight back? Here is the good news you've been waiting for. The ACLU does know how to fight back and where we're doing so, we are winning. The name of this fight back effort is Community Control Over Police Surveillance or CCOPS. CCOPS is a municipally focused legislative effort that shifts surveillance technology decisions away from the current secret unilateral police controlled process into one that is transparent driven by community opinion, 
and that rests final decisions about the acquisition and use of surveillance technologies in the hands of democratically accountable local elected officials. Most frequently, these are members of a local city council. Here's kind of a shorthand as to how CCOPS legislation works. CCOPS legislation says, as a matter of law, that moving forward, no surveillance technology can be acquired or used without the approval of the city council. As part of the effort to seek approval, the police department has to provide substantial details about the surveillance technology, what its powers are, and the policies that would govern its use. Those policies would be legally enforceable policies. It then, after a period of time passes in which the public, when they receive this information, can digest it, can form opinions, and can organize around it, then requires a public hearing in front of the city council at which the community can make its opinion heard. The city council then has to vote on that surveillance technology. And then there are mechanisms worked in where there is annual look back reporting to see how it is being used and to make sure the policies are being followed. There is no grandfathering in CCOPS. So any surveillance technology currently in use has to go through this process. And if it's not approved, its use has to end. Currently, 19 cities nationwide have adopted CCOPS laws, from the tiny Yellow Springs, Ohio, to our nation's largest city, New York. CCOPS laws now protect over 16.2 million residents, not to mention innumerable undocumented persons and visitors to the cities that have CCOPS laws. When CCOPS was launched four and a half years ago, we were pushing cities to take a chance on a new and better approach. Now CCOPS is the recognized gold standard. We have gone from asking cities if they would try out a CCOPS law to asking them why they don't have one. That might be a good question to ask in Tampa, hint, hint. <laughs> Let me conclude with a, a few final thoughts. My first is that not all surveillance technology is bad, right? Using ALPRs for toll collection, as I discussed before, or for identifying cars with amber alerts, uh, you know, and where the data for the ALPRs is retained for days, not months or years, is an example of two uses that the ACLU does not oppose. In the case of other surveillance technologies, and, and how many surveillance technologies fall into this category is a subject of fair debate, the risk of using the technology is simply too great to allow its use. Facial recognition technology, is, as we discussed, is one of the technologies that I think falls into that category. For many other surveillance technologies, whether they can be used safely and without presenting a threat to communities of color depends largely on how they are used and deployed and if they are governed by proper enforceable policies that are carefully monitored and audited for compliance. In the end, I do not want to see the ACLU or any other organization taking a paternalistic approach to the use of surveillance technologies, where we deem ourselves so smart that we're going to be the ones who draw the conclusion about if and how they should be used. You know, our, our opinion should matter, but it should not be dispositive. In the end, the only way to make the right decision about the use of surveillance technologies is to empower impacted communities with the knowledge they need to form an educated opinion and to let them make the final decision about what is best for their community. That decision-making process should be led by communities of color because the impact of surveillance technologies falls most heavily on them. My final thought is this. Our nation's movement towards the increasing use of surveillance is a movement driven by fear. Fear of crime and of those who our society falsely paints as those who are most likely to be criminals. We are told that without surveillance technologies, more people will become crime victims. That is an odd argument to hear, given that studies have shown the only crime that surveillance technologies effectively deter is car thefts in public parking lots. 
That's it. So instead, I will leave you with an alternate theory. Surveillance technology does not keep people safe and prevent people from becoming crime victims. Rather, when it comes to communities of color and other vulnerable groups, it makes people less safe and more likely to become victims of the technology itself and those who control it. We need to fight to make room for that argument to be heard. And we need to empower those who are the most targeted by surveillance to decide how surveillance technologies will be used if they want them used at all. While that will not produce an end to the fight against racially biased surveillance technology driven policing, it would be a good start. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Awesome, thank you so much, Chad. That was so informative. And I feel like I have so, so much to absorb. And now I'm probably gonna end up in a rabbit hole looking into surveillance um, <laughs> and, and find out what all's going on in our community. Um, so at this time, I'm sure that people have questions. So if anyone has a question, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to ask questions. Hey, Chad, this is Dave. What are some of the steps we can take here in Tampa to find out conclusively what's being used? Because I think that might be the first step towards taking action toward a, a CCOPS law. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, so, so here is the challenge. The, what seems like the theoretically right answer uh, is to use FOIA requests. The, the problem is, is that a lot of police departments are extraordinarily resistant to responding accurately to FOIA requests. Some will, but in my experience, most won't. It will make it very, very difficult. And so that is really the, the problem. And that's really why something like CCOPS is needed. Because in the absence of a law that says you have to disclose what surveillance technology you want to use, the police won't disclose it. They will use exceptions to FOIA, even if they are bending and twisting them to not respond accurately. And so that is actually the interesting thing about why CCOPS is needed. A lot of people will say, interestingly, like, well, how do we know, <clears throat> how do we know if we need CCOPS if we don't know what technology our police have? And my response is, that's why you need CCOPS because you should know what surveillance technologies your police have. So, you know, I would never discourage someone from sending their police department a FOIA request and trying to get what information they have. But at the end of the day, in the absence of a legal requirement that they publicly disclose that information, and again, not just after the fact, right? It's very difficult after your police spend $3 million on a surveillance technology to say they can't use it. They have to put it on mothballs. It's far more importantly to really have that debate and consider the ramifications before the money is spent. And so what I would actually say is CCOPS is, is, is what you need in order to ensure that the public actually knows what surveillance technologies are either being used or proposed to be used and has meaningful input uh, over those decisions. Let me ask a follow-up question. Is there, I know you said this has been used in small towns and cities as big as New York. Is there any research yet? I know this is relatively new that shows how this has improved policing in those places. Yeah, so, so th there's, uh, there, there have actually, it's funny you should mention research because uh, in, I think, are we still, yeah, in this month alone, I'm aware of three research papers that have been written about CCOPS. <laughs> so it is a very hot topic nationally right now. We've discovered a couple of really interesting things with CCOPS. One is that there are a lot less requests to use surveillance technology than we would have thought. And the reason for that, and I'll give you an example. Um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where there's a CCOPS law, Ring doorbells contacted the Cambridge police and wanted to set up one of these partnerships that they have in Tampa. And through a FOIA request, we actually saw the emails from the Cambridge Police Department internally, where they said, you know what, in light of our surveillance law, don't even respond to them. Like we would get filleted if we tried to have that kind of a partnership. And so 
what we what we've discovered is you know in secret the police may have said to themselves as they did in oakland and boston and baltimore hey let's get a surveillance technology and deploy it only in the communities of color to watch that population no one would actually go to a city council and ask for that right can we can we get the surveillance technology so we can watch persons of color so so there is a deterrence um we have also seen police being far more thoughtful and scaling back when they make requests to use it. So for example, um, there was a, I think it was in Santa Clara County, California, which is where Silicon Valley is. Uh, they wanted to use a, uh, an, an infrared device in helicopters to be able to like find criminal fugitives. But they were very clear to state that it was just for criminal fugitives if they were, you know, escaping at night or in densely pop, a densely like wooded area. And so they really narrowly tailored the request and they got it approved. But in the past, they would have just acquired it and used it for whatever they wanted. So there, there, there has been, you know, it's, it's still a fairly new program, but we're already seeing kind of positive effects for it. And I actually, before I forget, there is a public facing website and I'm gonna put it in the chat. It has all of the resources um, for, for CCOPS efforts, uh, including um, the, uh, the, the model bill and lots of information about different surveillance technologies. And it's designed to, to empower anyone who wants a CCOPS effort uh, to be able to do that. So um, I would suggest uh, if you're if you're interested in learning more about CCOPS to go to that website. I also, by the way, wanted to put my that's my Twitter handle. If anyone uh, you know is is doing CCOPS or has any other questions, uh, you can always uh, always ping me on Twitter uh, if if uh, if you have any uh, you know questions about CCOPS or anything else. So uh, speaking of FOIA requests, uh, I did one uh, about uh, automatic license plate readers about a month ago. I I sent in a request for um, any sightings of my own vehicle, my wife's vehicle, and with her permission, Gretchen's vehicle, to see, to see what they would give me back. So I, I'll share with you, this was the, um, this was a, uh, I guess it's not been enacted yet, but Tampa Police Department says that they're going to enact this policy, which says uh, it can be disclosed uh, by or to a criminal justice agency in the performance of official duties and it can be disclosed to the individual unless the individuals in an active criminal intelligence uh, information or, uh, uh, or active criminal investigation. Uh, surprisingly, they shared with me to my great disappointment that I was not currently under investigation. This, this, is, this, is, the, uh, this is the email that I got back uh, from, from the police department. And they said, um, you know, they didn't find any hits running that. Um, they, did, they did a quick search, but if I'll give them my my name and date of birth, uh, they'd be happy yeah. to double check, which I, I decided not to do. Now, holding that, is, that up, is, there, is there a PS there that says you are not under investigation, but PS you are now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they got to be wondering now. I think they know who I am and they didn't, weren't surprised by this request. Now, hilariously, um, this is to get it from the public. In my day job, I'm, uh, I'm a litigator and I represent insurance companies and I was working on a case where um, uh, this kind of uh, cargo van looking van like the, looks like the one that uh, Amazon delivers things to your house. Uh, it was insured as if it was somebody's personal vehicle that they drive to and from work, but we were pretty sure that it was secretly being used, uh, uh, lent to a company to use as a, a commercial cargo van. So. This is not the government, this is private. Um, I was able to pay $100 for this uh, surveillance report if you wanna see what one looks like. And here's the van, uh, this is its, its license plate and it's here it is photographed in various uh, parking lots. Um, I, this particular guy testified that he would sleep in Walmart parking lots in the van in between uh, you know, when he was done making one delivery and waiting for the next one, but... Um, Every time that it was parked in a parking lot, somebody took its picture and I have uh, the address and the license plate number, date and time and uh, of, of this vehicle. So we were able to show that, you know, the, this vehicle that supposedly someone was driving to and from work was in Minnesota one day and then uh, 
five days later in Shreveport, Louisiana, and a few days after that in Chicago and Florida and New Jersey. But um, but this was the first time that I ever did this, and the government had nothing to do with this. This is uh, this is not Big Brother. This is Little Brother. This is um, a network of these automatic license plate readers that uh, are are a bunch of repo companies are uh, networked into one another, and then. They warehouse this data and it's available to an asshole like me who's got $100 and some curiosity. So uh, what, what's a little bit um, frightening is that even, even with these, uh, um, even with a C-COPS law, even with some kind of control over uh, what happens, what the government's doing, you really don't have any control over these private companies that purchase these automatic license plate readers and take all these photographs and then they get fed into some central database where they are for sale. So, um, so, anyways, for for whatever it's worth, that's what a this is what an ALPR report looks like, and uh, uh, it kind of bothers me that I was even able to get this. This is, seems like more information than I ought to have been able to get. So, right. So, so there's two there's two things I would say about that. Right. So, um, I completely share your concern about those databases. Um, the problem is is that the right to photograph in public is protected by the First Amendment. <laughs> so, um, so there's really nothing that can be done about it. And this is, I'm not saying this flippantly, when the ACLU first found out about this, we were all geared up to try to do something to challenge it for about 10 to 15 minutes before someone was like, um, what about the First Amendment? We were all like, right. Um, but one of the things that is very important and that would come into the CCOPS process or even, you know, not, not every surveillance law has to go through CCOPS. You could, pass, you could pass a law governing license plate readers. Is that if you want to control the way that the government collects those photos, your law also has to prohibit the government from purchasing license plate reader data from any company that does not adhere to the same rules the government has to adhere to. And so otherwise, what you do is you go ahead and you create a loophole where these private companies now can say to police, well, you can't capture this data, but we can capture it for you and you just buy it from us when you need it. So I think it's a very important observation. Our model bill for regulating the use of automatic license plate readers specifically addresses that issue, that the government, that the government should not be allowed to buy data that isn't collected under the same rules governing government collection. Otherwise, it's just a, a very easy loophole. Is it, I, I had heard um, like the Amazon ring doorbell cameras that police can access that without a warrant, without you even knowing that they've done it. Is that, is, have I been told correctly? Well, it, it, um, it, it depends. If, if sometimes the police will go to someone and say, do you mind if we have access to your camera. I mean, they, they can't do it without your permission, but what they can do, and this is why it's valuable for Ring to tell them who has just purchased a doorbell, or even better for the police to have been involved in selling you that doorbell, is because then they can say, if they say, do you mind if we're, if, if we're investigating a crime near your house, if we look at your Ring doorbell, if someone says, oh yeah, that's fine, and they sign something saying that's fine, then they can. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people, either because they're not thinking about the larger implications of saying yes, or because they feel hesitant to say no to the police when they ask for something, will go ahead and give them that permission. And once they have the permission, they have the permission, unless you revoke it. So, so they, cannot, they cannot just by themselves decide they're going to look at your ring doorbell uh, data without a warrant. But if they get your permission, then they can. And that's what often happens. Is, I don't, I'm not trying to monopolize the conversation, but on the subject of, uh, of police partnering with private entities to get their hands on stuff that uh, might be given to them if they, even if they were unable to take it. I remember a few years back, there was a case uh, where a murder happened in Arkansas and uh, subpoena went to Amazon for, did Alexa record the murder and, and, and were they, uh, and I don't know what became of that, but do you know anything about Alexa, which is, it's, it's kind of like the telescreen in 1984, except we purchased them ourselves and installed them in our own houses. Is, is, is Alexa recording our conversations and could those be accessed? Uh, either, yes. either by having it uh, 
furnished, you know, voluntarily by Amazon or or by subpoena? Right. So 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 here's the answer to that question. So the first thing people need to realize was something like Alexa, right? A lot of people who are not familiar with the technology, they think to themselves, okay, I have to say Alexa before I want anything, right? Alexa, what is the weather outside? And so they contemplate that when they say Alexa, they activate the device and then it listens and answers your question, but that's not how it works, right? Because how does it know you're saying Alexa? What the device has to do is listen all the time so that if you say Alexa, it activates itself. Now, Amazon at one point said, we don't record conversations. We don't do that. And guess what happened? Well, it turned out that they don't accept when they do. Um, and then they claim they were only storing it because even though they didn't have permission to do so, they were doing it to improve its voice recognition. capabilities. Anyway, all of that is garbage. I, I don't buy it for one minute. Um, there's a lot that can be used with that data. For example, if you're walking around your house, well, I'll give you an example of my house. I don't own an Alexa, but for the last three or four months, my kids, and in particular, my daughter has been hounding me nonstop to get a dog, right? If Amazon hears that dog, 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 they can sell that information to people who are selling dogs, who are selling dog food, who are selling dog beds. And that's a way to generate money off of advertising to me. So there are huge benefits uh, to being able to, to, to listen in. Do we know exactly how much data that they are storing and for how long? We don't, uh, but we do know that they're doing it in some instances. And I think that's, that's pretty problematic. So. I would encourage people, um, if you want to find out the weather, go on the internet and type Tampa weather. <laughs> um, although that may require you to walk a few steps and type a few the keys in your keyboard, it's a lot better than having an always on microphone in your house connected up to Amazon. Um, but to each their own. If people want to go ahead, listen, if people want to have an Alexa because they think it's awesome to get the weather without leaving their couch, as long as it's an educated decision, I'm fine with people making whatever decision they want, but just bear in mind, there's risks associated with it. Um, I just wanted to preface my question by, by um, saying that often the strategy in order to um, affect these type of laws and changes is people who um, generally feel that they are not impacted by them. Certainly people in, uh, of color and college students, the people you name, probably know that they are affected by these guys. How now? My question is: How many people on the right who might have attended the January sixth uh, insurrection found that they are more likely to be under surveillance now? Yeah. So, 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 um, before we go to January sixth, I, I do want to point out an important dynamic, which is that um, there, if you want to call them on the right, and and you know, the, the more I do this work, the more that I realize the political spectrum in the United States is more of a circle than a line. Um, but libertarians are very good on these issues. Um, so uh, if, if you are thinking of doing work on these issues, there's gonna be a lot of progressive groups who will be on our side. Do not skip the libertarians. They, they are actually in some respects even better on these issues because government surveillance is one of their biggest no-nos. Um, but what I would say with respect to January 6th is um, I do think that there are a lot of people who are saying, hey, we're being able to, to get a lot of bad guys, um, some of which were just dumb enough to literally commit a felony, take a picture of themselves and post it on their social media, which, you know, I'm not a criminal defense lawyer, but I might suggest not doing that. Um, but people are like, well, you know, at least we are getting those guys, right? So what I would say is this, we have hundreds of people who engaged in felonies at the Capitol that day, but we have tens of millions of people in this country who are put at risk in their everyday lives by the overuse of surveillance technology. And I think that there's balancing questions to be asked. One thing I always say to people is this, I actually know how to end all crime in the United States. I have figured it out. I know the solution and I could do it tomorrow. You wanna know what it is? Put every single person in jail in solitary confinement. Done, no more crime, right? But the solution is far worse than the problem. 
And that is my concern with, with surveillance, with huge surveillance apparatus in the hands of local police. Yes, you may be able to use surveillance like facial recognition to identify some of the perpetrators of the attack on the Capitol January 6th, but at what cost, right? At what cost to the people who every day that is not labeled January 6, 2021 are the actual targets of this technology? At what financial costs, right, to the school programs and the job programs and the community building programs and the mental health service programs who that would actually have an impact on bettering people's lives and reducing crime? Instead, that money is spent on surveillance technology. So that would be my answer to January 6. It's if if the if the question is do surveillance did surveillance technologies help identify some of the people involved in that attack the answer is yes but that's a surface question it's not deep enough the real question is was it worth it were there other ways we could have captured those people and identified those people that may have taken more time but would not put the risks of 50 100 million people at risk by, by using these technologies. And I think that's that's the bigger question that, that needs to be asked around surveillance technologies in the January 6th attack. Thank you, Chad. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, I have not really a question, but a comment. Has there been any thought to the idea that and we all know that this is true, but of actually putting it kind of in a legal framework that it's a purposeful targeting of communities of color and because of that disparate impact that it's like on purpose and it's accelerating uh, the, the criminal justice issues and the disparities and that that might be a way to, I don't know, bring on board more people to the issue. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think that's a great question. The answer is yes. So, for example, you know, where, where we discovered that, um, you know, they were using a spy plane to, 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 to film all of Baltimore, along with other surveillance technologies in the aftermath of the Freddie Gray murder, right? We sued, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so, um, so I think it's very important to contemplate that the ACLU has a lot of tools in its tool chest and that to get ahead of this problem, we have to be prepared to use all of them. Um, it, it's, it's rarely do you have a big problem that has only one solution and rarely can big problems be tackled only using one solution. So I think you're absolutely right to highlight that litigation absolutely has a very critical and central place in pushing back against the discriminatory use of surveillance technologies specifically and policing more broadly. Thank you. Yes, I see Joel has a question. Yes, can you hear me? Uh -huh. uh, yes. What, what about the um, uh, what about the use of extensive uh, cookies that we're all faced with every time we we try to get uh, something that we're using? And uh, they, of course, the aspect of, of course from the, the companies wanting to make uh, money, but doesn't that just form another way of invasion? of everything that you do uh, because it's so extensive. That's one question. The second question I have, what about the use of foreign adversaries uh, being able to invade this uh, technology and use it for their own benefits? Those are, those are, those are great, two great questions. Um, so the first question really goes to a related issue. It's kind of the sister issue to government surveillance, which is private surveillance or corporate surveillance, or what, what we might call more broadly at the ACLU consumer privacy, right, in the digital age. Um, that is another significant problem that the ACLU is working on. Uh, the, 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 the challenge plays out in so many ways. Uh, you certainly named one of them. Uh, the public is generally not informed nor asked in any meaningful way uh, when it uses these technologies if they consent to being spied upon. I can tell you kind of as a general thing that, that a, one of the central kind of points of advocacy for the ACLU is that consumers should always be given an option to opt 
in to that sort of data collection. So the default can't be, we're gonna collect that information on you unless you tell us to say no. It should be different. We cannot collect that information on you unless you say yes. And you cannot, you should not have to say yes or should not be allowed to say yes in one of those huge user agreements that no one ever reads. I mean, I'm the ACLU's privacy guy and I don't read those agreements. <laughs> so it should have to be a very discreet point of asking. Uh, there are other um, formats in which these sort of violations occur, right? I think a lot about schools nowadays with remote learning. Kids in a lot of places are being said, you can either have your privacy or your education, pick one, right? We have to enact laws that do not force consumers or, or, or people who are consumers, not even by choice, like students, of having to give up their privacy in order to use the tools of 21st century learning and communication. And so I, so I think that that's, that's a real challenge. The, the second question you asked about, about foreign adversaries trying to come in is a really good one because uh, it, it goes to, I remember in law school, learning in, in, in property, which is amazing because I, I don't recall remembering anything from property when I took it, but it's all coming back to me now. Um, the idea of an attractive nuisance, right? So if I have a backyard swimming pool and I have all these great lights going around it and, you know, and a kid goes and drowns in my pool, I have a higher level of legal responsibility because I almost called the kids to the pool to use it, right? When you collect massive amounts of surveillance data, you create an attractive nuisance for hackers. They, they know where that information is. And so I think you're exactly right to, to say to people that when you decide to collect surveillance data just because you can, like there are risks associated with that. And so, you know, it is, a, it is almost impossible to keep surveillance data safe, right? To keep surveillance data safe, you have to have 100% of, you know, success rate against hackers. If you have a 99.9% .9 success rate, you failed, right? So, People, people and governments need to be really contemplative when they think about collecting sensitive data and just storing it because they can, because it creates risks. Now, the, I have, I've spoken to government officials. I remember having a conversation with the gentleman who was in charge of information security for the state of New Hampshire. And he said that he is terrified because he knows what an incredible pool of data he has for hackers. And he has to keep it, right? He cannot keep, he has to keep driver's license information. He has to keep voting information. But there's a lot of information you don't necessarily have to keep. And I think that goes to the point of your question. People have to be far more thoughtful about the risks that they create when they, when they just gather and collect surveillance data for the, for the sake of it. And I should mention that surveillance data, the collection of it, how long you retain it for, who you share it with, is all subsumed in CCOPs. So, so those are some of the questions that need to be answered uh, before surveillance is approved, questions like that. So those are two great questions. Thank you for those. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Did anyone else have a question? Don't see any hands or any unmutes. So, and I did, um, so Chad, I just wanted to, to note on what you're saying with, with the hacking that Joel asked. Um, I sat in a mediation recently where um, a man was being sued by credit card companies for a bunch of credit cards that had been charged off that he hadn't paid for. Well, come to find out he had been in jail when all these credit cards were opened in his name. And so somehow hackers and I'm imagining they got the data from the state of Florida because he was in jail and jail records are public records, but somehow the hackers were able to get this man's information and open it. It was, it was a lot, dozens of credit cards in his name and he had no idea that this was being done, but his information was out there available and someone got a hold of it. So that's, that's pretty frightening. Yeah. Um, 